And the father said, well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he made Adam and Eve and they made babies and they made babies. That's how we became born. The son wanted to verify this. So he asked his mother the same question. How were we born? How did we come to be? And the mother said, well, people say we came from apes and evolved into monkeys and evolved into humans. That's how we came to be. So we came from monkeys. The child ran back to his father and said, dad, you lied to me. Mom said that we came from monkeys and apes. The father said, son, that's only on your mother's side, not my side. Don't you know that? I want to wish everybody a very happy Father's Day today. And I'd like to look this Lord's Day morning. Thank you. On not just our earthly fathers, but our heavenly Father. God, our Father. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to two verses, two very familiar verses. The first one's in Galatians 3. In 26, Galatians 3, and 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And the second verse for this Father's Day, which you know very well off by heart. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and the children of God. Gracious Father, Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow down through his merit, his work, his blood, that we are thankful people to be called the sons and daughters of God. Bless this time together as we dig into the Holy Canon Scripture to the uh, to see some truths, Father, of thy love toward us, all given to us through thy Son. We pray in thy Son's matchless name. Amen. J.I. Packard, in his marvelous classic book, Knowing God, asked this question. What is a Christian? And he said the question can be answered in many ways. But the richest and best answer I can give is that a Christian is one who has God as his father. A Christian is one who has God at his as his father. But cannot this be said of every single person, Christian or not? As one commentary and Charles Stanley even said, the idea that all of us are children of God is not found anywhere in the Bible. God is the father of all creation, yes. God is the father of all the human race, yes. But he is only a personal father to those who receive his son by divine grace to become joint heirs to God. And I trust all of us here today have put their trust in him being the Christ we call joint heirs. You see, the Old Testament shows God as a father, not of all, but of his own people, the seed of Abraham. You see in Ezekiel 4, 22 and 23, it says, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go. And he's best described in the Old Testament as Yahweh or Jehovah. In the New Testament, it shows God as father, not of all, but of those who, knowing themselves to be sinners, put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, as their divine sin bearer and master, and so to become Abraham's spiritual seed. Slide three says, you are all sons of God through the faith in Christ Jesus. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Sonship to God is not therefore a universal status into which everyone enters into it by natural birth, but it's rather a supernatural birth, a supernatural gift, sorry, one receives through receiving Jesus Christ. Slide four says in John 14, 
and six. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And as previously mentioned, the gift of sonship to God becomes ours not by being born, but rather being born again. That's what it means, by being born again. Slide 5 says in John 1, 12 to 13, you know the verse very well, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, sonship to God then is a gift of grace. It is not natural. It is not a natural one, but is an adaptive sonship. And so the New Testament plainly and clearly pitches it. You see, in Roman law, it was recognized practice for an adult who wanted an heir to carry on the family name to adopt a male as their son, usually at the age rather than infancy as it is common today. The apostles proclaimed that God has so loved those whom he redeemed on the cross that he has adopted them as his heirs to see and share in the glory into which his only begotten son has already claimed. Slide six says in Galatians four and four wonderful verses that I think you should all read the chapter, the entire chapter. It takes maybe 15 minutes, if not 10. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth the son made of a woman under law to redeem, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out of father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Ephesians 1 and 5 in the next slide says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the goodwill of his pleasure, and it's a wonderful, wonderful verse. And to re reiterate our opening text, how great is the love that the Father has bestowed upon us. You all know him 26, backwards and forwards. But verse 2 says, No longer far from him but now, by precious blood made nigh, accepted in the well-beloved, near to God's heart we lie. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. One has said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his, God as his Father. Find out how much he makes the thought about being God's child. And having God as his father. Think about that. We who were no people. Can call upon the God of creation. And call him Abba. Father. Father. And he goes on to say that. If this is not the supreme thought. That prompts and controls. His worship and prayers. Then his whole outlook on life. Means he might not fully understand. The true aspect of Christianity. Or he needs to divulge a little deeper into the word of God to appreciate it much, much more. You see, New Testament believers deal with God as their father if they have trusted Christ. But you must have that trust in Christ and accept him as being the son, as your own personal savior. Father is the name by which they call him. Christians are his children his own sons and daughters, his heirs. To those who are Christ, the holy God is a loving father and they belong to his family. You all know our brother Jack Bowman's favorite song, The Family of God. It's a beautiful hymn. Beautiful. To be part of the family of God. It's wonderful. It's indescribable. There's in work we learn about this more in scripture, while chiefly and primarily in John's gospel, 
and in John's first epistle. You see, in John's gospel, the first evangelical blessing to be named is adoption. In John 1 and 12, is adoption. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Adoption. And also central in John's first epistle are the thoughts of sonship as being the supreme gift of God. The supreme gift of God. And according to our Lord's own testimony in John's gospel, God's fatherly relationship to him and his relation to him being the Christ implied four things. Four things. And these four things can be applied to our earthly fathers as well. Slide eight says, first, the fatherhood implied authority. Fatherhood implied authority. The father commands and disposes the initiate, initiative which he calls his son to exercise and the initiative result obedience to his father's will. And you can read there the verses. I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. I've completed the work you gave me to do. It also says the son can do nothing by himself. And another verse says my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And we are here to do the same to our heavenly father, as well as our earthly father. By obedience, by obedience, authority, authority. And as a side, beloved, to all the earthly fathers here, you're the spiritual authority of your home. Under God and under Christ, do not waver from it. Do not stray away from it. Do not stray away from the holy canon of scripture when it comes to decision making. When it comes to Bible-based principles, doctrine. Don't stray away from it when it comes to your children and see the blessing you receive through them. And above all things, wrap it up in prayer. Wrap it up in prayer. William McDonald has said, if you want to humble me, ask me about my prayer life. Ask me about my prayer life. And here's a man, beloved, that prayed two hours a day. Two hours a day, every morning at the crack of dawn. We need to pray. Fathers, you are the spiritual authority of your home. Just like the mothers are the most powerful spiritual influence in the home through prayer. We need to wrap it up in prayer. Daily. Not the five-minute prayer in the morning. But spend time communicating with our Father. Through his word. To receive blessings. Slide nine says, secondly, fatherhood implied affection. Affection. The father loves the son. The father hath loved me, it's written. I have, I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. Third slide says, the fatherhood implied fellowship. Fatherhood implied fellowship. You can read, and it says in John 16, 32, in the latter part, I am not alone, for my father is with me. It also says, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do what pleases him. End of slide. Fatherhood implied fellowship and closeness, beloved, between the father and the son. And as a side, let, let me say something. And listen to me here, please. And I'm glad our brother Arthur Dixon touched on it for one small point when he preached here last. And which was preached on this very platform 25 years ago, because I was here. 
by a brilliant, brilliant Bible mind and a brilliant prominent teacher that had to take his talents to the States. When he said, we need to read our Bibles carefully. We need to read our Bibles carefully and be even more careful when we try to interpret things unto ourselves and give it to others. What do I mean by that? Well, many a time you'll hear people say that the father turned his face away from his son. The father turned his back away from his son. Beloved, it wasn't the father that turned the face away. It was his God. For my Bible says like yours, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not his, not his father, but rather his God. And I believe strongly that it was the father was closer to his son in those dark three hours than ever before. Just like you and I, who were all parents, that if a son and daughter needed us in their deepest, darkest need, would we not be there to hold their hand in the hospital bed or by a bedside? Of course we would. Of course we would. And in like manner, beloved, so was the Father. So read our Bibles carefully. Now, you might say it's all semantics and interchangeable, just like we say we gather around the Lord's table when it's really the Lord's Supper, because you know the Lord's table is your own personal table in which you gather throughout the week to bring to God in your basket full at the Lord's Supper. Yeah, you know, we can argue that. And it's not totally incorrect, but we need to be, in, be careful when we interpret things and interpret it properly. For this same Bible preacher, beloved, never preached on a passage unless he read it how many times? 100. True story. 100 times before we come to a platform and read it. You know why? Because things you find at the 87th time, you'll, you won't find sometimes at the 17th time. So read our Bible carefully because the greatest interpretation of the Bible is what? The Bible itself. The Bible itself. And you've got two or three versions just like me. So read our Bibles carefully. Next slide. Fourthly, fatherhood implied honor. Fatherhood implied honor. God wills to exalt his son. It says, Father, glorify your son. The father has entrusted all judgment to his son, that all may honor the son, just as they honor the father. And we need to honor God the father as well as our earthly fathers a little bit more and i think we lack a little bit here do we not do we properly honor our earthly fathers rightly do we properly honor god our father properly we honor him by gathering lord's day after lord's day for thanking him for giving him giving us his only begotten son so we need to honor God the Father and our Holy Father a little bit more. And this extends to God's adopted children being us. In, through, and under Jesus Christ, their Lord. For we are all ruled and loved and companioned with honor. And blessed by our Heavenly Father. As Jesus obeyed God, so must we. This is the love of God that God begat and that we keep his commandments. First John 5 says that. It also goes on to say, as God loved his only begotten son, so he loved his adopted sons. The father loves you, John 16, 27 says. As God had fellowship with Jesus, so does he with us, his adopted children. Our fellowship is with the father and with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As God exalts Jesus, our Christ, so he also exalts Jesus' followers. As brothers and sisters in one family, we are together, joint heirs with him. John 12 and 26 says, If any, any man serve me, him will my father honor. You see, we touched a little bit on sonship.
So we'll now touch a little bit on uh, adoption. Slides are good, thank you. You see, adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, even higher than justification. Adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers, that the gospel offers, even higher than justification. And if you do some digging and studying, I think you'll agree with that profound statement. You see, free justification is God's supreme blessing to us as sinners. That justification, by which we mean God's forgiveness of the past, together with his acceptance for the future, is the primary and fundamental blessing of the gospel. And that is not in question. You see, justification is the primary blessing because it meets our primary spiritual need. And by contrast, adoption is considered one of the supremest blessings. And it is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as father. You see, in adoption, God takes us into his family and fellowship. He establishes us as his children and his heirs. Closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. So to be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is a greater thing and something that we need to capture. Something we need to dig into and read more about to know God, for it is a great thing. We read Galatians 4, 1 to 7, where it says, Paul says that where your faith is in Christ has brought you, you have received the adoption of sons. And it also says you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. You know, the word adoption in the Greek means in state in stating as a son. And it only appears five times. And of these occurrences, only three refer to Christ, the Christian's present relationship with God in Christ. And you can find that in Romans 8 and in Galatians and in Ephesians. You see, when it comes to adoption, it's surrounded with love. And the New Testament gives us two fine yardsticks for measuring God's God our Father's love. The first measuring stick is the cross. And the second gift is of sonship. We just mentioned in our opening text, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Do you know what that first phrase means? Behold, and do you see exclamation points everywhere when you read that verse? I do. Behold, what manner of love. Do you know what the actuality of that phrase means, this translation? It means that it's from a foreign country, from another country. That's what behold, what manner of love means. It means it's foreign to us as the children. We don't understand it. We cannot comprehend it. We are not familiar with it. Just like if you go to a foreign land, you're not familiar with their customs and their ways of life. In like manner, beloved, in this beautiful verse, behold what manner of love is something that we cannot truly grasp because it's foreign to us. And of all the gifts of grace, beloved, adoption is the highest. Adoption is the highest. Think about it. When you realize that God, our Father, has taken us from the guttermost to the uttermost, as someone has said, and made you and I a son and daughter in his own home, then our sense of God's love should be beyond degree and beyond what words can express. And as we sang this morning, more than tongue can tell. And as slide 11 says, with Charles Wesley's great writing, in one small verse, oh, how shall I the goodness tell, Father, which through to me has shown that I, a child of wrath and hell, I should be called a child of God, should know, should feel my sins forgiven, blessed with this anticipation of heaven. You see, beloved, God adopts us out of free love, not because of our character. And record shows us worthy to bear his name, 
but despite the fact that it shows the very opposite. While we were in our trespasses and sins, while, what happened? Christ died for us. We all of us, in essence, are not fit to be in a place of God's family, but yet how thankful we should be. You see, adoption by its very nature is an art of free kindness to the person adopted. Example, if you become a father by adopting a son or daughter, you do so because you choose to, not because you're bound to. Similarly with God, our father, because he chooses to. He has no duty to. He need not have done anything about our sins except punish us as we deserve. But he did not do that. He did not do that. He laid on Christ all the sins of the world. All the sins of the world. Why? Because God is love. And he has loved us and redeemed us and forgiven us. And took us in as our sons and daughters. And gave himself to us as our father. All through Christ Jesus. Why? Because God is good. And God is love. And he also as adopted children. Give us that assurance. That every adopted child needs. To be assured that they're part of the family they belong to. And we are assured. We are part of the family of God. Through love. Through blessing. And through eternal life given to us. Through Christ Jesus. Why? Because God is good and god is love and with this i close true story our brother boyd nicholson early on in his ministry was preaching one day at his home assembly in saint Catharines. it was an evening meeting and he needed a ride home so there was this very successful and wealthy businessman said, you know what, Mr. Nicholson, I'll drive you home. But before I drive you home, do you mind if I show you my new 4,000 square foot house I built and the office tower we're purchasing to move into and a new property we're going to build? Do you mind if I show you that along the way? Brother Boyd, always being the fine gentleman, said, no problem. So they went off and they drove. And this well-to-do businessman said, here, Mr. Nicholson is my home. There's the office building we're going to build. There's the property we're going to purchase. You see, Brother Boyd, I must be doing something good for God to bless me in this manner. Brother Boyd Nicholson, without missing a beat, said, son, God does not bless you because you are good. God blesses you because he is good. And don't ever forget that. Period. End of story. Needless to say, the rest of that ride home was a little bit quiet. Beloved, and that's the gist of it all. God does not bless you because you are good. He blesses you because he is good. How can we not forget that? How can we not be thankful to God, our Father, for his goodness toward us? You know the song, No Merit of My Own. His anger to suppress. My only hope is found where? In Jesus' righteousness. Let's give thanks this Lord's Day to our earthly fathers. As well as our heavenly fathers. For God is good. Our heavenly father is full of love. And he shows that to us through his son. And adopting us as sons and daughters into his family. Because of all his goodness given to us through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the rich love you've demonstrated upon us. In the giving of thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our sin bearer. We thank thee that in him no sin was found, but yet you placed on him all the sin of the world. And we thank thee, Father God, that your love is shown as written in scripture that God was reconciling the world unto himself. Unto himself. Because thou art love, Father. And you did not impute our trespasses against us. Bless us this day. Let us be mindful and thankful 
for our earthly godly fathers, as well as our heavenly father, for all the blessings we receive in Christ Jesus our Lord.